Good evening, church family, and welcome to our moments with Pastor David and Marie. And what a a joy it is to see you, church family. And I always want to introduce Pastor and Marie. How are you guys? We're good. 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 Thank good. You. Things are changing rapidly, huh, Pastor? Mm-hmm. As we last time we we spoke, uh, now we're at the beginning of a new phase with our church, and we'll be beginning this Sunday. And and what are your thoughts? on our return, and mostly what are your thoughts with the response that we're anticipating from the people? Well, my my response, the way I'm thinking of returning is kind of like with mixed feelings. Um, obviously, I look forward to it. I'd say Marie and I both look forward to being able to resume uh, live services. We've missed, we've missed being with our people, and I've, I've missed the just the connection that we have, uh, teaching online as I've been doing, is an, has an impersonal kind of feel. And uh, so I, I look forward to having some living listeners, you know, other than my staff, who have to listen because I'll fire them <laughs> if they don't. Um, but uh, I'm, that, that, I'm looking forward to that. I'd say we both are. Um, mm. On the other hand, I realize that there are quite a number of people who are afraid that uh, the press has, uh, the media has, has inundated them with one fear after another. Now, this is not to say that some of the things that have been said, uh, <laughs> excuse me, are not accurate. Uh, I'm certain that m- much of what has been said has an accuracy to it. But there seems to have been not just a reporting of news, but a shaping of views mm-hmm. that was taking place at I think anybody who isn't blind would see. And so in presenting this this virus in the way that they have, in such a way that they have, it's caused a lot of those who are very trusting of the media, very believing that there's no reason that they would give to them a view that is slanted in a political sense. Um, It's given many of them um, pause, and many are afraid especially the older ones. And the older ones in our fellowship are more vulnerable as, as it seems that the data and science is, has stated. And I, I think in, the, in that I can trust that because I'm hearing that from both sides of the aisle, if you will, from the conservatives as well as the, the, those that would be considered uh, more liberal. And they're saying that uh, there are certain things that, that we older people should be aware of. And I, and, and, and I have been, but at the same time, I think that it's put a spirit of fear into a lot of people. So what am I expecting? I'm expecting to be here. Marie has to be here. <laughs> so we're expecting to be here. And I, I don't want to put the Lord in a box. God does things abundantly above all I could ask or think. But if I were to tell you what I've been hearing from all of my pastor friends, I haven't heard a single one say anything different than this. They're all saying that initially people are not showing up at church, even though the doors are open and the green light has been given, that the churches have been infected with fear to the degree that the members of the church will not come. And there are members of the church who are leaving the church because the pastor opened the doors and thus he must not love anybody because he's opening the doors and and that shows he's more ambitious and he wants his bills paid and he doesn't care about people. So what that does, at least in the way that I see things, is it reveals the heart of the congregation. You know, if you can't believe your pastor, if you couldn't believe him when you were there, you shouldn't go back anyway, right? right. I mean, if you think he's lying to you and, and using you to further some agenda he has, then, then why are you there in the first place? If you're not getting fed the word of God, if you're not walking out feeling closer to Christ and desire to be more with Jesus through his ministry, and why are you there in the first place? So I do expect people to not show up. I do expect people to, to have uh, underlying uh, physical conditions that do not permit them to show up. I've already received emails from beloved members of our church who really want to be here, but because their physical condition right now doesn't allow, uh, I don't want them to feel any guilt at all for not being here. That's why we're going to continue online services. We'll continue doing things online for their for their benefit, but as for us, uh, we're going to follow all the CDC guidelines. I think we've even gone beyond the guidelines 
in terms of our preparation. We will have our ushers prepared to encourage people to, to follow the safe distancing rules and we will have the sanitation possible and all of those things. And if people wanna know what we're gonna do, just go online. You can see us, see what, we, what we're gonna do as is listed on our, on our page. And I'm sure you'll share some things before yes. we close. But uh, on, on my personal uh, page that I have, my Facebook page, church page, the church web page, and uh, various um, things like Instagram and, and all of that. We're trying to get the word out. So we'll have 8.30 and 10.45 a.m. services. We will not have child care uh, provided for the first uh, probably several Sundays that we're back. We will have out, outside seating that's prepared for families. We'll have overflow prepared in the event that uh, people show up in a greater number than we assume. Um, we are, I believe, as prepared as we can be. And from that perspective, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing our people. I'm looking forward to, and I, I know Marie's feeling the same way, um, just looking forward to it. And this Sunday, second service, I'll be dedicating my, oh, my grandson, Jackson. That's going to be cool. You know, and so, yeah, he, he's a beautiful little guy. Yeah, he's a sweet baby, huh? Very sweet. Baby. So we're looking forward to dedicating Jackson. So oh, that's going to be cool. Jackson so, David, I should Jackson say. <laughs> he's named after his papa and some guy named Jackson. I, I think he had five <laughs> friends or something. <laughs> I'm not sure. So church family, it's a, a great opportunity for us to come out and see the baby dedication. That would be sweet. Uh, so that's a good plug. And in. I should say this, on uh, Father's Day, we're going to be dedicating Elena. Oh. And Elena oh. is is my son David's baby girl, who is uh, named after, after Marie. Oh. You know, that's my middle. That's your name. middle name, right? Yes. I was named after an aunt, yeah, Marie Elena. Wow. But yeah. So. so church family, come on out. <laughs> <laughs> and she's a beautiful baby girl. Oh, yes, absolutely. She's a teeny doll. little thing. Mm. Oh, she's not teeny. She's a little chub. <laughs> she's a little chub, but she's oh, teeny to me though. Yeah, she's a, she's precious. I see yeah. Jackson. I saw him yesterday, and it hit those eyes. Oh, he's just those. He's just looking at me. handsome, handsome, yeah, handsome baby. Boy. Doesn't look like us at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I want to transition to what we spoke about last time. We we spoke about communication within the marriage, and we went at lengths to speak on how communication can either encourage, discourage, build up, or destroy a marriage. Uh, Pastor and, and Marie, if you want to add to this, when a marriage is struggling, where Communication has now really become argumentative. It's been discouraging or attacking another person's character. How does a couple then now show the love and the respect that for one another that Paul instructs in Ephesians chapter 5? I don't believe it's communication when you're attacking people. I, I think that communication is deeper than that. Genuine communication isn't uh, um, using language and words to to assault somebody, especially if you actually love them. So the first thing I'd say is that they don't, they're not communicating at all. Because if that man or that woman feels that the best way to, to speak to their mate is to uh, demean them or threaten them or whatever, they're not, they're not communicating and that's, that's the biggest problem. So communication as we've been speaking about it uh, together is, is not just hearing the words, but it's understanding the feelings behind the words. And it's the seeking out uh, the meaning of those words. It's like learning uh, a foreign language. And uh, I, I don't know another way to put it, and I think it's a, a good way to put it, is learning the language of that person. And that means that you have to look beyond the words that are being used to the meanings of the words. What does he or she mean when she says that? And that's where a lot of people, I think, fall down. And that's where they have their problems. It's because they're not willing to take the time and sacrifice the ego to learn uh, what they're saying. And then sometimes if that person uses a word that is uh, not correct or perhaps is saying something that uh, they intended to say something different, but they said this, then that's where these people very often, people who are argumentative very often just wanting to win an argument and not be concerned about that person, that's where they they'll latch on to that word that they just used. And, then they'll, they'll say, well, you, you said this, and then they want to make that their hill that they fight and die on, which is stupid, I mean, to be honest yeah, with right, you. Right. That's a really a dumb thing. I mean, this is a person that you say you love, 
but you don't want to understand what they mean. So it's a lot of dying to self. It's a lot of caring about somebody else. It's a lot of uh, patiently listening with the intent to learn. It's the studying of that person to, to, to learn their language, to, to learn what they're saying. And, and over time, what happens, John, is, is you begin to, to see, well, that word means this to this person. Uh, it may not mean that to me. I, I have a different view of that. But it doesn't matter what it means to me. What matters is what it means to them and how that fits into us. And so that's how Marie and I, over the years, I would say that's how, how we've learned. That's how I've learned with my wife. I'll, I'll speak in a personal level. That's how I've learned my wife is what language is she speaking about? You know, you know we joke about this, but some women can't tell you something directly. So they'll say, uh, does that belong there? You know, <laughs> and, and right, does that belong there? Um, and you'll go, it's been fine with me for as long. And then you learn, oh, she's saying, I don't want that there. And there are all those little silly things that we joke about, but they're real. They are very real. So I learned, and I've learned over time, some of her love language that a question very often is a statement, you know, and and uh, what do you want to do is very often what do you want to do that i want to do <laughs> so you learn that right right what do you want to eat mm -hmm. which is another way of me saying and what are you hungry for <laughs> see so you learn that's true that's it's true. just learning it is it's true. learning the language you know me i'm a plain kind of speaking person i usually i would think don't hide behind words i usually just say what i'm thinking my girl, on the other hand, you know, I had to learn what she meant. And then she's plain speaking in her own way. I just had to learn what her way was. And so what is that? That's work. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of work. <laughs> Excuse me, because we're always, when we're dating, we're always wearing our best. Right. We're it's always true. being the best we can be. The most polite, the most patient, the most warm. The most loving. Right? The most caring, <laughs> yes. Right. I mean, you know, because we, we men, and this may be generalization, but I'm, I'm thinking is there's truth to it. Uh, we like to be presented as hunters, and we are in many ways. We, we have that instinct, if you will, that built-in uh, hunt, conquer, and take for yourself, and, and we do. So what do we do? I, the best hunters learn how the prey, you know, where they're going to be. What do they do? What do they like? They, they spend a lot of time. Well as they hunt them, as they discover these things about them, they say the things that they want them to say and all to win them. I, I think that's, that's wrong. I think that's, uh, that's it's not right when you have a real relationship, but that's a matter of fact that people do that. And what you have to do is you have to realize what you're doing and begin to actually ask yourself questions, which is take, take some work. I had to learn to do this, where the questions are real, not so I can find a way to have power over her, or manipulate her, or to use something on her later on because she disclosed something to me, but so that I might love her better, so that I might understand her better, so that I might know what she means when she says this. Because my girl does that with me, and and we've been together a long time, and and you know, just it's just was it today or yesterday? She's this is how she says, "I want you to buy some new sh new pants." I did today. Just today, today. I, t I said, I can't wait till this is over with and <laughs> we're going to go, you're going to need to buy some pants. I'm but that's not you. how she said it. No. How she said it was, these pants are really faded. <laughs> yes, it was. Exactly. So that's her way of saying, and I it's said true. to her, oh, so you want me to get some other pants? <laughs> it's true. And it's she true. goes, I can't I hardly wait until this is <laughs> I've been so looking you... at these faded pants. And she's standing there I'm doing saying, the wash, right? I'm that you learn those things because as a man, I say, I can still put them on. They still they fit. Still look I'm, good. I've been I've been wearing these for years. <laughs> I say to myself, they're, I haven't gained weight. They're this is very, good stuff. They're very faded. These <laughs> new ones and stuff like that. Bottom so you, line. <laughs> so you, you learn the language. So all that you know, the destructive talk, the communication. From what I'm hearing you say, Pastor, is it takes work. And it takes effort and it takes diligence to put that 
time in to really learn the language of our spouses or, or one another, which really requires dying to self. Because I think one of the things that happens is that there's this destructive part that's there that is looking for the, the fuel or the word to latch onto. And, and it just goes from there. And it's a, it's a crazy cycle. It just then starts, you know, circling and then there's no respect. There's no love. There's no respect. There's no love. And it just goes down. Mm -hmm. And I think taking that component out, dying to self and really looking to how can I learn my wife? You have to love her. You have to love her. John, I, I, I learned I learned that the, the tongue is a, a piercing instrument. Yes. It's a sword. And the, the more you know of the person, the more you have on that person. You know, the more they disclose of their heart to you and their, their, their sorrows and things that cause them pain, those all become weapons. Mm -hmm. They're arrows, you know, and you can use them later on. You, and and, and I, I did in our early days because I fought dirty. You know, I fought dirty because you don't want to lose the fight, so you're going to win it at all costs. And and so at the beginning, and, and again, we didn't fight a lot. I'm not going to pretend that we did. We didn't. But when we got into a disagreement in our early days, mm -hmm. uh, I would go straight to the arsenal, you know, straight to the arsenal, you know, because I'm going to I'm going to win this fight quickly. I'm not going to I'm not going to mess with you. That's that was my attitude. We're going to just get this over. You want to go there? This is what you just, that's how I was. And, and just direct. And, and, and Marie could get hurt. And I'd say, you know what? You deserve it. You know, that's my attitude. And I'm not talking about last week or last month or last year or 10 or 20 or even 30 years ago. It's beyond that. It's when we first began together and as a husband and a wife when I didn't know how to lead. So what I did is I just used the tactics that, that I used before I was saved. I used the tactics that I would use when I argued with anybody. I'd go straight to the juggler, and 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 that's it. It's over. You can't win this argument with me. And Marie is a very gentle spirit, and for her, she didn't want to argue. So mm -hmm. it was like I, I eventually God just broke my heart, and He really did. He broke my heart over how are you treating my daughter, and that's my little girl. So that's a very real story. I've told mm -hmm. you. Yes. That's a very real story, because. Honestly, didn't I honestly didn't realize what I was doing? I was just fighting the way that I that I would fight in an argument. That's all I was doing, and I came from a a family that was very direct, and so I just added the emotional aspect to it, and that that's has to stop. That had to stop with me, and 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 you have to love that person, and and I finally realized and. You know, and I feel I've, I've done all right for a long time. Yes. <laughs> but but I, I'm serious. I had to realize that in, in this whole world, there's only one person that is important to me to the point I'll lay my life down instantly. And it was my wife. And my babies, of course, are under that umbrella, but Marie's the very first. And I had to realize that. And laying down your life is not necessarily taking a bullet or an arrow for her. Laying down your life is, is, is ceasing being the dominating bully who, who, who has to win every engagement. Mm -hmm. And laying down your life is learning to die to yourself so that she may be blessed and, and that she may know she's loved. And even though there's a difference between us right now, that she has the, the awareness that we'll work this through. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going to go to the point of hurting you simply because I'm bothered by something you said or did. That I had to learn to do that, John. And and it all comes down to what we call love. Loving her, loving her. If Christ loved the church, he gave himself for her. Why can't I bite my tongue, shut up and listen to her heart? Why can't I? Why can't I let her feel what she feels? Why can't I receive her as she is? Why do I have to make her into what I want her to be so I can control her more easily? Why can't I value her for who she is? I chose her as a woman that I said I will love forever, and now I'm trying to change you into something I want that's different? No, the Lord had to teach me those things because what I have with my wife, you know, I have to tell you, and you know, I hope every husband can say this, there's no one else. Why would I not treasure and cherish this woman 
because she's the best that God had for me. Why wouldn't I do that? So yeah, you have to learn to die to yourself. You need to learn to bite your tongue, to shut up, to listen to her words, and just to love her. Love bears all things, and love covers all things, all sins. And, 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 and that's what you do. Because Marie and I will say this, we can say this, each one of us, at the end of the day, we chose us. Mm -hmm. We chose us. And in order for us to remain, I have to die to myself. And she does too for herself. Absolutely. That's how we do it. Pastor, you mentioned something in, the, in this dialogue recently. You said you didn't know how to lead. That's yeah. key. I think a lot of uh, marriages where, the, where we see a lot of this going on, the man doesn't know how to lead. Can you shed a little bit more light on what that is, not knowing how to lead? I, I believe that the best way a man can lead his wife is to begin by teaching her the word or being with her in the word of God to make an agreement that whatever God's word says, we too will do. See, when it becomes just John saying this to your wife, and now it's gonna be living you fighting each other over what you're saying. But if you guys get into God's word together and you agree, we're gonna do what the Lord teaches us, then the fight's not gonna be between you and her. The fight's gonna be between you and the Lord. Right. And, and when you're in the word together and you say, let's agree to do this, so that comes through reading and studying, having devotions, going to church together. And Marie, in my case, um, <laughs> over the years, um, she, we've had the Word of God that has, has was at the beginning uh, the thing that drew us together. Yes. But it's the Word of God that has kept us together. Yes. And so I don't quote scriptures to her and say, <laughs> you need to do this, thus saith the Lord because Maria knows the scriptures. My wife knows the scriptures. I simply have to say, you know, this is what we need to do together. And, and so at a certain point in your marriage, you've been together in the word for so long, John, that what happens is all I need to do is say, you know, um, and she'll do the same, by the way. Um, in the way that we speak, we will refer to something we know in scripture. And that's, you, you know, as I'm thinking out loud, because I never think of these things, I would say, and I think I'm speaking for us, uh, Maria, my life is, is pretty thoroughly imbued with scripture. Maybe, maybe not every word and word and word verbatim, but the, the error, uh, what do you call it, the aura, the, the atmosphere, uh, it, it's, it's our backdrop. So we know what love is. We know to love God. Mm -hmm. We know to love each other. And if this doesn't fit into loving God and loving each other, then it's something we need to talk about. How's that work for us? And that's your foundation. Everything in life has to have a foundation. And that's our foundation, which has been scripture. Marie and I have been together since 1974, 75. We've been together a long time and She's heard a, a lot of Bible studies. I, I've, given, I've, I've given about 8,000 or more Bible studies, John, and Marie has heard a lot of Bible studies, a lot of conferences every day. And I can say this before the Lord, Marie and I every day talk about the Lord in one form or another. She shares something she read in her devotions. She'll come and hear me teach the word. I'll speak to her about every day. And it's not just on a, a Wednesday and, and a Sunday. It's a seven days a week, 365 days a year, 40 plus years. That's what it's been. And so that's our atmosphere. And so we can't sin against the Lord without knowing we have. Mm -hmm. That's very we true. We can't. And so we together say what he says, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so if Marie, if Marie at all, which she doesn't have to, you know, honestly, she doesn't because I'll, if, if I do something wrong, one, the Holy Spirit tells me pretty quickly. But two, if I sense that I've done something, she doesn't even have to tell me. I'll, I'll say, you know what? I got to watch myself. You know, I'm sorry. That's how we are. So we don't, we don't, we don't have to wrestle. You did this. No, I didn't. You did this. No, I didn't. We really don't do that. We did that in the early days. Mm -hmm. But eventually mm -hmm. I said, you know what? 
and a lot rests on me. My wife is a very gentle, tender-hearted woman. If we wanted to argue, John, I have to pick the fight. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. She doesn't pick fights with me. She doesn't. She doesn't create tensions for me like that. I, I do not bear that. I do not have a wife who disrespects me. Mo Marie does not disrespect me, never does, never does. Would never speak to me without respect. She just doesn't. That's why if she went to heaven, you know, before me, I'll never remarry. There's only one person like her on the face of the planet. And I wouldn't want anybody else. I wouldn't want anybody else because she knows me and I know her. And, and my heart does safely trust in her. It really does. And so she knows me the way nobody knows me. She knows me in the way that a man should be known by a woman. She does. And I've tried to get to know her that way. And the key for her, and I speak for her because uh, I do most of the speaking in our family anyway. <laughs> but the key for her, and I know I'm speaking for her when I say this, is uh, all I need to do is love her. Mm -hmm. That's all I need to do. If I love her, everything's fine. And it is. It is. Thank God. Thank God. You know, when you're speaking of the how the Lord and Scripture is woven to the fabric of your marriage, what would you say to those who are, and I hear it a lot of times, who say, you know what, I'm going to build our foundation on the Word of God on Christ, and it seems like it's just a trial run. And then oftentimes there can be the wife who's like, oh, now you're going to be super spiritual all of a sudden. You know, mm -hmm. there's no room to grow. There may be times where they're just given this, the the fabric of the scripture and, and Christ and all of that that makes the foundation of a good marriage as if it's a trial run. And well, it didn't work for me, so I'm going to. And they go on with this marriage that supposedly is in Christ and and I hear this when I'm working with families and couples. You have some, baby. You know, like Marie, when, when, when a woman says, well, you know, are you, all of a sudden you're super spiritual now. Oh, now you want to bring God into the marriage? And, you know, that can be discouraging for the well, man. Well, it is. It is discouraging. I think she, that's a foolish thing answer to say, tell, tell your husband, frankly. If he's seeking to, to, to mend the marriage, what a... What a blessing that is that he would want to work on his marriage. And I think sometimes you have to put aside all those other things that you've got in your mind that the enemy has given you to say, well, he didn't do this, he did that. Oh, he did that and uh, he went out with, he went out on, you know, all these things she, we're not to throw, I would not throw those things in a, a man's face, especially when he wants his marriage and he wanting to get together his marriage in the ways of the Lord. Uh, I think that's very disrespectful, John. I, I, and I, I think that um, she needs to go to the Lord and she needs to seek out what she needs to do for him. You know, I, you know, and, 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 um, because she's not right in this, you know. You want the two, you want the couple to be able to both work together, in, in loving each other and encouraging each other in the ways of, and living for the Lord, you know, living for the Lord. I mean, if you can't do it right now for, you know, for your husband, live for the Lord, because you know what? If you're living for the Lord, you eventually come around and live for your husband, because God shows you, you know how we are, to, how we are as you read his word, how we to behave. Um, you know, a woman who, who um, bashes a husband, it's, it's very humiliating. I've seen women bash their husband in front, in, in front of people, and it's very humiliating. And it makes her look bad, too. It makes her look and bad. And it damages the marriage. It really huh? dam it damages the marriage. You know, it really does. I, I don't I don't understand that, you know. I I don't.
and you know what comes from that, and I hear this, and I'm just basing these things on on these questions from the things I see uh, in observation. You know, when when there when there's this communication breakdown, there there's no diligence in wanting to learn the language of one another and not laying down your own life for the for the wife for the life of the other, whether it's a husband or the wife. So often and so quickly, we start hearing the word divorce thrown around as if it's a viable option. What do you think about, what do you guys think about that? I believe very strongly that the today's quote unquote Christian uh, has less uh, ethical understanding of, of uh, marriage, if you will, than atheists. Why do I say that? Because I saw a, a study done that, that uh, said that evangelical Christians divorce at a quicker rate than atheists. So what do I think? I think that they don't believe God. I, don't, I think they don't believe the Word of God. They don't believe in the power of God. They don't mm. believe that God can actually work miracles. They don't read this, the scriptures, so they don't know God's Word. You mm -hmm. know, and uh, right. what, what they're doing is they're simply saying, this is what my heart tells me, and I feel this, and I'm not happy, and you know, I didn't get my trophy. Everybody gets a trophy in life. <laughs> I should get my trophy, you know, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I, I'm not happy. Things like that. Where's the Bible say that you're supposed to be happy? I mean, that's an interesting thing. You know, we're blessed. We're blessed in the things of the Lord, but the pursuit of happiness is not a guarantee of happiness, and you don't get it. That's not a guarantee in Scripture that you're going to be happy. Uh, I've shared this in the church. You know, there's happy, happiness simply is a derivative of the word happenings, and happiness is something that is basically based on uh, circumstances and situations. If something's good today, I'm happy. If something's not good today, I'm not happy. My circumstances make me happy or not happy. But what we have in Christ is joy. And, and, and people don't understand the power of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. They don't understand the Word of God, the promises of God, and all of this. What very, very often, and you know this, you do a lot of, of marital counseling. I, I, that's what I did for the longest time. And I discovered very early that the couples who are coming with problems are not in fellowship, they're not in prayer, they're not in the Word of God, they don't serve the Lord, they're not in God's Word at all. They, and then they come in telling me, can you help me fix my marriage? When in fact, you've ruined it. When, and you think that an hour of conversation that you are not going to listen to because you came in making up your mind that you're going to get a divorce or you're going to remain unhappy, you think I can convince you? You are not open to it. That's why Jesus said that Moses permitted divorce because of the hardness of your heart. And that's the problem in divorce is it's, it's that people will come in, their mind's already made up. They're looking for the door to get out of. Uh, you know, I married her because it was in God's permissive will, but God has a perfect will for me and, and I'll find the right one. This was the wrong one. I was in the flesh when I married her. And, and all these hyper-spiritual garbage excuses when in fact God says to the, the children of Israel in the book of Malachi, he says, you, you know God hates divorce. And um, they don't. They see it as an option. You know, and um, we lived in a time when society, we grew up, Marie and I grew up in a time mm -hmm. when society was opposed to easy divorce. Mm, that's right. I mean, part of what kept you together was that there was a, a frown that society gave to you because they knew the value of family. They knew that if you, if you destroyed the families in the community, you destroy a nation. They knew that because there was a time in this, in this America that we live in today mm -hmm. that uh, marriage actually mattered. And so you had the church that was teaching strongly, remain married. You had laws, government had, had, had passed that said, we will not give you a no-fault, easy divorce. And you had oaths to God through the church that you made, where you said, I will love you till the day that either you place me in the arms of Jesus or I place you in his arms. I will love you till death do us part. And my promise was not to, to, to Marie alone. It wasn't to the witness. It right. wasn't to that, that pastor. It was to God. And because I don't fear God and I want pleasure more than, than God, I will do whatever makes me happy. That's the sickness that we have today. It's a sin thing. 
And so if people actually took their vows seriously, if they said, with God, all things are possible, I can be a new creation, I can forgive the things that have been done, and we can move on together, you wouldn't see the divorces. Mm -hmm. But because you think, oh, there's, a, there's, you know, the grass is greener on the other side of this fence, they forget that you have to mow that grass too, <laughs> you know, and it has to be taken <laughs> right. care of, right? I mean, it always looks more pleasant when it's a distance away. But that's what you thought when you asked that girl out as a man. You looked at her and you said, I'd like to take her out. And that's what you thought when you thought to yourself, I'd like to give her a kiss. And that was what you thought when you said one day, I want to be with her forever. What changed? What changed? What happened? What happened? What happened is you didn't get your happiness. You found out she's a human being the way you are. And you think you're perfect, that you don't put, her, you don't make her upset. You think that she doesn't have a wish list with you. <laughs> you got to be kidding. So two sinners got married, That's right. and they've got to work it out. And with God, all things are possible, and they can be a testimony of God's grace, or they can live in sin, call it grace, and get married again to somebody and destroy their lives too, because you're an unrepentant sinner who doesn't want to deal with sin. If somebody says. If my wife sins against me, I have options. And if somebody says, I have no, you have options. I can release her. If she said, forgive me, I release her debt, because that's what forgiveness literally means, to release someone from a debt. I release your debt. I release it. Because there's something greater than me right now feeling good. And that is, that is honoring God, honoring our vows, caring for our children. Mm -hmm and moving forward, right. and we can do that. We can do that. And I just think, John, it's just too easy to get a divorce. It seems like sometimes, go ahead, Marie. They're too selfish. Yes. Both of them, you know, it, 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 it's selfish. It's all about me, and it, it isn't. It isn't all about me, it's, it's us. It is about us, you know, encouraging one another. I mean, women need to encourage their husbands. Find something if they can. Find something to encourage them, but encourage them. Um, uh, oftentimes, they're out there working in the workplace, and I know the women some are doing that too, but they come home, we, we don't know what their day's been like. And um, they need somebody, to, when they come home, to encourage them, or have their dinner re ready, or, you know, but. I, I have my dinner ready, I have the feather out, Fan. <laughs> Libby feeds me grapes. Oh, you wonderful, know. John. Well, and one of our beautiful. fights that I got into with Marie was the fact she didn't peel my grapes right. <laughs> oh, that's I was really upset. That's terrible. Like, really what? upset. Or to cherish one another. Um, that, that is a commandment, to cherish one another from the Lord. And, and a woman needs to look at her husband. What can I cherish? What, what can I see that's so good about him? Start thinking that way. What are the things? How can I encourage him? Men need encouragement from a woman, as well as women need to be encouraged, you know, loved by their husbands. We need the encouragement. We need to be loved, and, and, and as well, our husbands need to be loved and encouraged. I think it goes back to what you were both saying about, you were saying, Pastor, about the vows. Mm -hmm. I think so easy today, the mm -hmm. vow that we make before the Lord isn't sacred as it That's needs true. to be or it should be. And it, and it's almost a, it's almost one of these things where the vows sh should say, well, for better, for worse, for happiness or not, mm -hmm. you know, they take. It's almost taken in that sense. Or if it doesn't work, uh, I can divorce you and find somebody else. You know, mm -hmm. they've allowed these conditions to creep into the holy sacred vows to the Lord. Well, if you don't feel, if I don't feel this way, then I'm going to. Mm -hmm. And and you know, it goes to my next question is, is uh, and it's a. It's a rhetorical question. I know the answer. We all know the answer. But I see it so common. Is not having good communication grounds for divorce? Uh -huh. Of course not. You know, Jesus never said that. Nowhere in the Old Testament nor in the New Testament does it say, well, if you guys don't communicate well, you can always find somebody you can communicate with. So, of course not. Uh, people are always looking for, um, for ways <clears throat> to uh, to uh, to get out of their covenant, you know they they look for loopholes. You know the Pharisees were very good at seeking loopholes and 
you know, when they ministered uh, during their day, when they, when they taught during their day. They were always looking for loopholes, ways to get out of something, you know. Uh, you know, the Sabbath law says that I can carry something a certain, a certain distance. How can I stretch that distance? Oh, well, they, they, they made a judgment that anything that was my possession actually became my household. It could be like looked at as like my house. And so before Shabbat, I would go out and I would put something that was mine in a certain location and that became my residence. And so I could actually map out all through the city a route with my possessions. And, th and thus I could find a way to get around what the law said. And the Pharisees were very good at that during the time of Christ. And that's why Jesus would say, you know, that they're hypocrites because they were teaching men, uh, the they were teaching others the commandments of men and not honoring the commandments of God because they were finding loopholes and everything. And that's what people still to this day do, John. Well, oh, I love Jesus, you know, and, and I don't want to sound like I'm mocking, but, but this is actually what I, I hear. Oh, I love Jesus. You know, it's just I don't get along with her. And, uh, how can you, and John, you're right. He, John says to him, how can you love the invisible God? You know, how can you love a God whom you do not see and hate your brother whom you do see? He, in other words, that is not possible. The way that I show love for God is loving those who are created in his image. And if Jesus is saying to me to love my neighbor as myself, well, who is my neighbor? Well, my wife is my neighbor. So if I'm to love my neighbor as Christ loved the church and I love her with the same intensity and the same devotion and the same care that I show to myself, then maybe that means I need to die to myself in order that she may blossom. And then here it is, here's the secret. When my wife is blossoming because she's loved deeply, she loves in return. And as this girl is loved and cherished and, and she knows it, then whatever makes me a happy man, especially when she's in the word in prayer, led by the spirit, Whatever she knows makes me happy is something she wants to do. And sometimes it's, it's difficult. Like there are, there are foods that I like that, John, it takes a long time to make. <laughs> you know, sometimes, I know one yeah. for sure. Yeah. My chili. Lady, <laughs> yes. <you know. laughs> With the white sauce. That's right? an, oh, yes. Yes, yes. And that's an all day thing. It is. So I don't ask her for that very often. But if I say to her a couple times in the week, because the first time she ignores. <laughs> but, but if I say that in, a couple times during the week, I'll know that, that she's going to take a day to mm -hmm. make me my favorite meal. I know she is. You know, and so I don't ever ask for it. I don't ever ask for it. And that, that also secures it. Because sometimes on her own, she'll, she did this just a couple weeks ago. She, I came home, she says, I'm making you chili rellenos and I said oh I've died and gone to heaven <laughs> the know? third heaven that's because she knew that that's something I had wanted you know that's the little thing that's silly some people think oh come on give me something real that is real you know if if I die to myself if I try to make her life the happiest I can make it the best that I can make it which I try uh, she appreciates that and that's key that's mm -hmm. That's the, mm -hmm. the secret that you, were, it's not really a secret. That's the key of it. Right That's there. love. That is love. <laughs> yeah, and when you're, and love. when you're fighting with one another, your children see that. Mm -hmm. And they're going to pick up. We were just talking about that. Mm -hmm. And that's where they learn, mm -hmm. right? That's where they learn to they see. Learn. Oh, that's how he treated mama. That's how she treated yeah. dad. That's and how they I, define words. Yeah, and sometimes they grow up thinking, oh, well, I could get married, and then if I don't like this person, I could just divorce him. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Look at my parents. We've seen plenty of that. Yeah, exactly. Plenty of that. What would you guys say to those, in, in, uh, and we'll wrap up with this, this question here, allowing the outside influences come into a marriage, for example, allowing a parent mm -hmm. to... <clears throat> have a, a lot of say into the marriage or having a uh, stepchildren or uh, ex-wife or when the, the wife is turning into a mom or the 
husbands turning into the dad. We, we spoke a little bit about that uh, and uh, how that can really come in and cause a wedge in the marriage, allowing those outside influences come in. What would you say to speak into that? You want me to speak? To you? <laughs> Go ahead. Mm-hmm. I never allowed that. You know, uh, I, I know that the two shall become one flesh. And I also know that when you get married, that the family comes along with the bride or the husband. I, I realize that. You know, and I love my in-laws. I, I, I loved my father-in-law. He went home to be with the Lord a number of years ago. I love my mother-in-law who's still with us uh, very much. I love my brothers, Marie's um, brothers. I love them like they're my brothers. I love her sisters like they're my sisters. So in many ways, um, I don't know how they feel about me, but I know how I feel about them, and I love them. I love them like they're my own. And Marie loved my mama and mm-hmm. loved my dad and, and loves my sisters, yes, yes. you know, with all of her heart. I mean, she calls them sissy. They, they love each other. Yes. So we have that within us. But will I allow them to come between us is a different thing. Mm-hmm. The answer is no. No, because I didn't marry uh, her family. I married her, you know. And so all along, I have protected our family in that way from the very beginning, from when Marie and I were newlywed. And my mom was very open in sharing her feelings and all, and our family's that way. It's a, a trait. You know, we're open with our feelings. Mama was, I am. Um, but she tried to share with me about my wife, you know, and the very first time she ever said something to me like, well, I want to tell you about Marie. I said, that's my mom. I said, that's, that's no, you're not going there with me. This is my wife and I'll take care of whatever my family business is and you're not welcome in. I mean, I was very plain with her. You're not going to talk to me about my wife. And if you have any issues, Mom, you need to talk to her because she's the one you have issues with, not me. And I was very plain spoken. Again, when I was in my early 20s, I still am at my age. But I had to be because I knew that someone could drive a wedge if they were given opportunity. And uh, that's where a big problem is. is I I have counseled people in this church because (laughs) the mother of the bride very often, some mother of the bride mm-hmm. very often. Um, you know, I don't like the way he's treating my little girl. Though I have seen very often where the the husband's mom doesn't want to relinquish her, her precious baby. Mm-hmm. I've seen that plenty sure. too. And, I, and when I think about it, I would say it's more common for the mother of the of the son to cause problems in the family. Mm-hmm. I would I mm-hmm. would say that because you didn't you didn't make the food the way I used to. You, my hus- my son likes the, I've seen that. And so I've had people ask me, how do I deal with it? And I've said, you know, well, you're, you're not babies anymore. It's not like I'm talking to an eight-year-old or nine-year-old. You're married, you've got children. Do you think it's time for you to sit down with mom and dad and say, listen, please give us some room to be ourselves. We love you and all, but we're not gonna put up with this. And whenever mama, my mama, my mama would do this on occasion, would try and break into my family. On occasion, she tried to. I always would put a stop to it. I'd say, I'd look, I remember one time, real remember this, mom came in, was telling me, we were at my parents' house. My mom said something to me, and I looked at you, and I said, it's time to go. And, and Marie starts to pack her thing. I mean, instantly starts getting her things, and my dad says, settle down, settle down tells my mom to calm down and butt out, basically. And that's how it was. It's, it's just, I, 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 I believe strongly in uh, it's the two that became one. I do not believe that it's the two plus mom, dad, and, and uncle so-and-so who's got good advice to give. You know, I don't buy into that because that's not how it's supposed to be. So it begins with just Marie and me. Now, if we talk and say, you know, I'm going to ask your mom something, I, or maybe we ought to ask dad something, mm-hmm. together we would. Yes. And so I could go and say, hey, daddy, you know, I'm thinking about this. But I've already brought it up to Maria. I've said, honey, you know, my dad knows something about this. Do you mind if I talk to him? And that's just out of respect for us. Because whatever I decide is going to affect her. 
So I'm not going to have my dad stepping in. Son, if I were you or my mom, well, honey, you need to, which my mom did. <laughs> you, know, you need to this, this, and that. Or You, you know, my son likes, and, and Marie's just a very good woman who just kind of, res she respects her elders. Mm -hmm. I had to step in, you know, most of the time. I'm sure you had your moments with mommy, but I had to step in. <laughs> Mama was real strong. She really was. She was. She was sweet. <laughs> she meant well. See, she, was sweet. she always meant well. She was she, sweet. She did. She always. She no, my mom. But I, I, I know. I, I could tell you. I know. Sweet. I, I would. I would know when she was trying to communicate with me. It was obvious. <laughs> you know, it, it was Manipulate. obvious. Yeah. Well, on the other mm -hmm. hand, my mom was quiet. Just a quiet. My mom and dad were pretty quiet, weren't they? Yes, very They quiet. were pretty quiet. Well, you guys, thank you so much for this time. That I really appreciated it because you gave some practical insight to some of the things that can come into the marriage and really bring destruction to the marriage. It can really bring uh, despair. And, you know, we have, we have people in our church, couples that are hurting, uh, that need practical guidance and practical wisdom that I think was offered up today. So I appreciate that. And I'm sure our church family does appreciate that. It is hard to be in a fight with someone you're in the Word with and in prayer with. That's God. true. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's Never what it comes down that. to. That's a great thing. And it's that's hard what it to comes fight down the to. one you're in the Word with and in prayer with. That's hard. How can you get into God's Word and then fight immediately afterwards? So if you decide, let's read, pray together every day, your marriage changes. And let's mm -hmm. do what God says. And it's a radical change. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you don't want your children to become you. Yes. Absolutely. You want them to be better than you. Absolutely. You want them to, to live lives, godly lives, with people who love them. And you need to show them the example. And absolutely. sometimes you've got to keep your mouth shut, ladies. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. That is so key. I mean, oh, Eve opened her mouth, didn't she? <laughs> she did. She opened her mouth. Let's not let's not be Eves. Yes. And I think it's important when the when the husband does want to lead that the wife is supportive of yes. it. Yes. And then vice versa, when when the wife wants to share that the husband's supportive of, of her wanting to share. And mm -hmm. and Pastor, you, you both hit it on the head. Praying and in God's word. There's no I, I mean it's as laid out as much as possible. I mean, how clear can it be? If you agree to do what the Lord says, you're fine. Yes. You know, somebody wrote on the internet recently, and I th thought it was funny, but there's truth to it. They said, seeing that you believe everything you read, why not read your Bible? Mm. Right. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So amen to that, you guys. Thank you. And one thing, church family, as Pastor mentioned, we do have information on our church website, on all our social media platforms, on the guidelines uh, laid out by the CDC per our governor's uh, statement on reopening the church. So if you have any questions or want some more information on that, go to our website. Uh, you'll see it right there as you open it up, and there will be a link to click, click on as well. That open up another page with more information on that. And we do look forward to seeing you. We do look forward to having our church family come out and, and be a part of our, our worship. And so anything you guys like to say in closing? Well, we love you. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday, and I won't be kissing any of you. <laughs> <laughs> we can't wait. We can't wait for Sunday. God bless you. Guys. God bless. We love you, church family. God bless you.